I appreciate uh, being invited to speak today. Uh, this is really the conclusion of the trial that ASAP has funded, and uh, so I'm delighted that I can present some of the results. The results are just coming out now, so this is completely pre uh, preliminary at this point, and, uh, uh, and we're, we're currently working on the publication. So hopefully there'll be more details in, in the future. So the question is, why are we here? Why are you here? Um, and one issue is learning. Families with Chiari and Tringamalia want to learn about their disorder, want to learn what to do for their children, for themselves. But the second is making a difference. A lot of you are here because you want to make sure the research goes forward, make sure there is better communication with the physicians, and make sure everybody else understands uh, and is, is, is able to be heard. So research is a huge part of what ASAP has done over the years. And that's the first way to make a difference. The second is improving the care. And the third is minimizing complications. I'm not just talking about surgical complications. I'm talking about the complications of the disease. If you look around, you'll find older individuals in wheelchairs. It's very unusual to find a Chiari and Syringomyelia patient, a young patient in a wheelchair these days, because these were misdiagnosed in the past. And so, Long-term complications of disease is, a, is an important factor that we have to, uh, to address. The thing we learned in the past five years is Chiari malformation, Chiari 1, is not a rare disease, even though it's still listed in the National Organization of Rare Disorders. And the NIH is still listed as a rare disease, but it's not. If you look at the, some of the publications from Michigan, up to 3% of the population might have something that looks like a Chiari 1 malformation. So we're not dealing with a rare phenomenon. What we are dealing with is a disorder with significant controversies. And the reason for the controversies is that we're looking at an anatomical problem that's obvious on MRI and attributing all kinds of symptoms to it. Um, Attributing etiologies, for example, if the problem is in the physiology of the CSF and has nothing to do with the tonsils, like with Chiari Zero, for example, how do you explain that? And that stirs up controversies in diagnosis, controversies in treatment, controversies in surgery, what type of surgery to do. If you do a surgery, what type of results you get, and the results are mixed. Unnecessary fusions reoperations, and remember that wrong surgery or wrong treatment has irreversible consequences. All these are crucial. This is why you're here. You're here not just to learn about the disorder, but to learn how to push for improvement in the care of this disorder. This is what led to this study. Marcy Spear, the late Marcy Spear, was uh, force of nature, a lot of, a lot of you have seen, have, have known her. She uh, was the, the person that really uh, empowered research in this organization, and uh, along with others around her. And she was uh, the reason this research study that I'll present today was done. So ASAP has a responsibility to continue to fund this type of research, and more importantly, to continue to guide physicians and scientists to collaborate, because with collaborations, research, research, research improves. It's much better than having your own shop and trying to work for 20 years on your own. In 2005, Marcy and, and I and a couple others have conducted a survey of the ASAP membership. And what we wanted to know is what are the most important questions they have 
what would they like answered that we don't have an answer to? And this is a spattering of the answers that we got. And what you will find is the vast majority found that a comparison of study of Chiari surgery techniques was the most important question they needed uh, answers to. So this is why we decided to address this question. Then we went to the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgeons, which is our senior society. We asked for its backing for a project. And we ran a survey. And the survey was published. And the results of the survey show that about 45%, uh, about 90% of pediatric neurosurgeons opened the dura with Chiari 1 decompressions. And half of those will coagulate the tonsil. Less than 5% did craniectomies without opening the dura at the time. So that allowed us the ability to choose the centers and the surgeons that are going to participate in the study, trying to make it as unbiased as possible. We wanted lack of bias in sites and geography and the type of surgery. We also wanted to have uniform collection of data. We wanted something as unbiased as possible in terms of how data are accrued. Uh, we wanted good statistics, and we recruited uh, John Kessel, who's, uh, who's our main statistician in pediatric neurosurgery, to help us design it. And we wanted a believable endpoint. If you consider headache as an endpoint, you can imagine that there are various ways of interpreting a headache, not just in terms of location and severity, but uh, you know, how do you rate it? What does one out of five or four out of five mean? So it's very subjective. We wanted objective findings. The only objective finding is syringomyelia. Did the syrinx resolve, or is it still there? And then we wanted that to be assessed, not by the surgeon who's doing the procedure, but by a committee of unbiased physicians. So we have two neuroradiologists, one neuro, uh, two neurosurgery faculty, and one neurosurgery resident uh, that, that did the evaluations. Um, again, we wanted to eliminate bias. So no ASAP medical advisory board member was part of the study at the beginning. There was just one exception at, uh, later in the, in the study. Uh, the managing center, uh, so mine and Tim George, who, who's, uh, who's my uh, uh, partner on this, did not accrue patients from our institutions to eliminate bias. And we tried as much as possible to do geographic diversity and, and surgeon diversity. And these are the participating centers. Um, UAB, Pittsburgh, Boston, uh, Duke, Portland, DC, Chicago, and Tampa. All the patients were pediatric, not because we didn't care about adults, but because we wanted, again, to eliminate bias. Chiari malformation, Chiari 1 malformation with syringomyelia were all the patients, and there were specific characteristics of the syrinx. It has to be more than 50% of the diameter of the cord, uh, et cetera. There was no surgical randomization, but all the data were, were gathered prospectively. And we asked for MRIs from all the, 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 the groups. Initially, the plan was to have three groups, craniectomy, craniectomy duraplasty, craniectomy duraplasty, and tonsillar shrinkage. We could not get enough patients or centers to do craniectomy alone, so that was eliminated. So instead of the 90 patients that we were planning for, we ended up with a little over 60 uh, divided in, into two almost equal groups. So there were 73 subjects accrued. Complete records were available from 68 complete MR evaluations in 58. Uh, half the patients, half the, uh, the surgeons used autografts, which means dural grafts from the patient's own tissue, and half used allograft. And then the two groups were posterior fossa decompression with duraplasty 
or posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty and tonsillar shrinkage. And you can see the percentages that, that have done those. There was no difference in demographics uh, between the surgery types, between the sites, or between the surgeons. And the symptoms, obviously the most common symptom is always headaches. The interesting thing is half of those had frontal headaches, the other half had occipital headaches. They were not, not all occipital. There were some Valsalva-related symptoms, oropharyngeal dysfunction, as Dr. Menises has many times taught us, sensory motor symptoms, and cranial nerve abnormalities. Exam findings included uh, cerebellar symptoms in 18%, motor symptoms in 16%, scoliosis in 18%. Uh, there was no sleep apnea, and there was no fibromyalgia or uh, any other uh, uh, syndrome or abnormality that could interfere with our diagnostic uh, uh, assessment. Uh, Follow-up visits were actually pretty good. We up at, at one year, 81% of the patients had follow-up visits. At three months, 93%, and at two weeks, 97%. So we were happy with, this, uh, with these numbers. The vast majority, 84 to 86%, improved or uh, the, the symptoms improved or resolved. And you can see the variety of symptoms here. Again, the interesting finding is that frontal headaches has had just as much improvement as occipital headaches, which is news to me. Um, but in all of the categories, there was improvement. There was only uh, one area, oropharyngeal dysfunction, where the, actually someone got worse. MRIs between three months and one year, again, evaluated objectively by three independent teams. The first team were two faculty neurosurgeons. The second team is a neuroradiology uh, faculty and neurosurgery resident, and the third team is a, another neuro, neuroradiology faculty. And when you compare the difference between the three groups, there was excellent agreement between the three. So there was no, there was no inconsistency. And these are the results. 85% improved or resolved the syrinx. And about 12% uh, got, or 14% uh, were unchanged or got a little worse. No, no one got significantly worse. And you can, you can imagine here that this is three, to, three months to one year, which means that we, we've often seen syrinxes take two years to, to improve. So unchanged doesn't mean that it won't be, it will still be unchanged a year from now. So what does this all mean? Well, this is a pilot trial. Pilot trials are designed to show feasibility. Okay? So what the co first conclusion, surgical trials and Chiari and Syringomyelia are feasible. We can get a few centers together, hard-headed surgeons from various institutions to agree on a plan and do a study. The kinks were worked out. It literally took us three years to get this uh, study off the ground, but once it got off the ground, it worked out very well. So we've learned a lot for future study. Interestingly, is pilot data indicate that tonsillar shrinkage may not add benefit. The majority of syrinxes resolved, the majority of symptoms resolved, with or without tonsillar shrinkage. Which begs the question, is tonsillar coagulation important? And what are the long-term sequelae of this? Are there more adhesions in the posterior fossa because you're coagulating the tonsils? And are we to seriously assume that a part of the brain, the tonsils, has no function? I think that's not likely. It's more likely that there is function that we have yet to identify. Now, again, this is a pilot study, which means it's not answering this question. It's giving us hints on what important questions there are that should be answered in a large trial. 
And, and that's, I thought, was the, the most important question of the study. So again, pilot studies play a key role in the development or refinement of new interventions. In this case, it's an old intervention. Assessments or other procedures. Commonly, results from pilot studies are used to support more expensive and lengthier pivotal efficacy or effectiveness studies. They're not there to answer a question scientifically. I can't tell you that shrinking the tonsils is not important. I just tell you that based on results of a small study, it does not appear to be important. How can ASAP make a long-term difference? Continue to fund similar clinical studies. I think after all is said and done, and after the trials and tribulations that we went through to get the study off the ground and get it to go, I feel that it's been a very important uh, uh, project for ASAP to uh, not just promote, to create, promote, and fund. So it's important to fund clinical studies like this. It's important to target important questions. Keep running surveys among themselves, among yourselves, among the physicians. What are the important questions? Dural opening. Now Dave Limbrick's group is, is starting a multi-center trial, a bigger one that's going to target dural opening. Is that important? Tonsillar shrinkage, I hope the next big study would really address this more seriously. Fusion. And then other studies such as genetics, imaging, and clinical. It's really important that ASAP supports large registries to answer specific clinical questions, such as the Park Reeves registry, or the the common data element uh, efforts that are going on now nationally. And encourage physicians and scientists to collaborate because that's really uh, a crucial point of all of this. If we each are in, in a silo doing our own thing, we're not going to be as good or as able to answer important questions as if we collaborate among uh, each other. So I'd like to acknowledge ASAP and thank them for funding this, this study. Uh, thank Tim George for partnering with me on it, the participating centers, and our Office of Clinical Trials. Thank you. I'll take questions. I don't know. I mean, we, we often see, you know, if you have a trauma, right, or surgery, or if you have a stroke, uh, when, when someone has a stroke, part of the brain dies and it's irrecoverable. Part of the brain around it, it's called the penumbra, gets sick. And initially you think it's not working, but then after a few weeks it starts working again. So 